So I ask you, please, please, I beg you, before we're on the news, because one of our children is hurt, because this team did not take action. And I implore this commission to use all its resources to clear out the camp immediately. You are failing at your job, you are failing me, my family, our neighbors, and you are failing the very people you are charged with helping. They're frightened for their kids, fed up with their government, and demanding to know what will it take to clear out the homeless camp under the Ship Canal Bridge in Seattle for good. The Spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. These parents of John Stanford International Elementary students say WashDOT and the King County Regional Homelessness Authority have ignored their concerns, allowing the right-of-way tent town to bring biohazards, fires, drugs, and violence to within a few blocks of their school. Good evening and welcome to the Spotlight. I'm David Rose. Such was the power of those parents' pleas that their appeal was heard all the way in Olympia. Governor Jay Inslee told me first last week that state and local agencies were about to launch a major cleanup effort under the bridge, and now it's happening. But as the Spotlight's Matthew Smith reports, it still may not be enough to satisfy neighbors. Early this morning, WashDOT crews and contractors placed caution tape, rolled out new fence, and began cleaning up a portion of this encampment under the Ship Canal Bridge. I think our message to the neighbors is that we hear you. Uh, that is part of the reason that we're on site today. But many locals say the latest moves, which included reducing fire risks after a different encampment's fire last week, well, they say they're not enough. You are failing at your job, you are failing me, my family, our neighbors, and you are failing the very people you are charged with helping. Please, I beg you, before we're on the news, because one of our children is hurt, because this team did not take action. There's always been a security risk here. There have been other gun incidents. There's been fires, and now there's been a fatal shooting. But what are we waiting for? Parents of children that attend John Stafford International Elementary want more action. And this latest letter from Washington isn't helping. They said they haven't identified, quote, anyone residing there that poses an imminent threat to public safety. An idea parents I spoke with today didn't like. They point out there's been shootings. The idea that it's safe, not matching their feelings. But what's key is that all of this is unfolding while KCRHA is asking for a five-year budget in the range of $11 billion. A cost some are balking at now, given the struggles to clear current camps. Though groups reviewing that budget have stressed, the two are not necessarily connected. We have crying urgent needs right this very minute and an inadequate system to meet those needs right this very minute. And we're trying to deal with that while at the same time building something bigger and more longer term that will mean that we are not in the same position when the emergency arrives after the system is built out the way it ought to be. The situation we're left with when it comes to these right-of-way camps, temporary shelter beds aren't good enough, but permanent housing won't come soon enough. In the meantime, I found some homeless people who have been building their own solutions, and the result is threatening public safety along highways from Seattle to Spokane. One of the most audacious new builds in Seattle sits on the Mercer Street exit right of way. It has room for two, with easy access to Lake Union, Amazon, museums, and restaurants. The house itself is the latest in green living, built entirely of reclaimed materials left over from nearby construction. You would just see them on a daily, just go back with stuff, building stuff. Susan lives next door to the Mercer Street camp. She sees the drug use and desperation. She wants the people there to get the help they need. Obviously, these people, they they have problems, serious problems. But Susan feels like now it's her problem and a problem for the whole neighborhood. Crime, drugs, property damage. A lot of police, um, a lot of the fire department goes next door. Sometimes it could be at least four to five times a day. But she says no one in government is really taking charge while the camp keeps getting bigger. Even when we do call them and tell them something, they don't do anything. So the people that are doing the damages are just getting away with it. Clustered along the I-5 and I-90 corridors, an astonishing 2,221 camps have cropped up on WashDOT right-of-ways, according to the department's latest survey. And long-term structures like the ones off the Mercer Street exit now appear in more than half of them. More permanent structures allow the risks for WashDOT to pile up. 
Hypodermic needles are the most common danger, followed by human waste and biohazards. Workers who come to the camps have been threatened with violence. And let's not forget the risk to motorists. As we prepared this story, a fire broke out at the encampment bordering I-5 near Yesler Way. Flames bursting from the trees as cars steered clear and the camp cleared out. But the real danger to the community only emerged after the smoke cleared. Police found weapons, $7,000 in singed cash, along with meth, cocaine, and fentanyl. This wasn't a shelter for the downtrodden. This was a straight-up drug den spread out on state land. So I went to the land owner, Governor Inslee, who promised this camp and the one under the Ship Canal Bridge were going to get swept as soon as possible. We have plans to move almost 200 people in the next couple of months out of those encampments. The next couple of months, so I asked the governor, why not now? Well, it's a partnership. The Department of Transportation first locates the problem statement. Then we work with multiple agencies, uh, with the local police departments, with local nonprofits, and the nonprofits, usually the ones who actually we contract with so that the nonprofits operate the shelters, operate the tiny home villages, operate some of the subsidized housing that we have built, and then we need long-term housing. Inslee says this housing first approach adopted by the state and local agencies has been working. Since last spring, 17 right of way camps have been permanently swept clear thanks to the policy. The 369 people I think we moved off, uh, off of our right of ways, the vast, vast majority of those people are still uh, uh, sheltered and housed. They haven't gone back because we've provided a place as opposed to just chasing people from one corner to another. But 17 locations cleared equates to less than 1% of the total number of camps on Washdot's right-of-ways. At this rate, it will take more than 40 years to relocate them all. In the meantime, those who live and work near the camps have been left to wonder why housing the homeless seems to be more important than their safety. I understand that it is the philosophy of the authority to wait until people are ready and meet people where they're at. While we wait, people are slowly dying under a bridge and our children, families, and school staff are being subjected to this public safety hazard. Don't let perfection be the enemy of good here. The mayor of Spokane shares that mom's frustration. The city sued after Washdot allowed Camp Hope to grow on its right of way until 600 people were staying there. The city of Spokane has spent nearly a million dollars to mitigate the impacts of that uh, encampment on the neighborhood. And that includes private security. It includes uh, trash removal, uh, overtime, police overtime every single day for 12 hours a day. Spokane since been granted $24 million from the Washington right of way safety initiative, but the camp is still there. Our cities are impacted by the policy that has allowed uh, homeless encampments on state right of ways. And, and what do we do as a jurisdiction when we really have little control? over um, the encampments that pop up when they're in the city limits, but they're on state property. Like Spokane, right-of-way camps are a growing drain on Seattle city resources. For example, the Seattle Fire Department responded to more than 1,500 fires in homeless camps in 2022, up 80% in two years. We also have to be honest with everyone and realize that some of these conditions are unsafe and there's criminal activity that we concern ourselves with. Seattle Mayor Bruce Harrell told me the state is creating a no-win situation when asking communities to choose between safety first and housing first. We are trying to do the right kind of work to make sure it's safe for everybody. And I think that, if I may elaborate, I think most people realize and have empathy for a person that is so down on their luck and they're sleeping in a sleeping bag and, and somewhere they understand that. But I think where their empathy starts turning into fear and even anger is when they see the blatant criminal activity that seems to go unchecked. We've heard a lot of talk about cleaning up the Washdot camp problem, but now we want to introduce you to someone who was actually taking action. Well, I started out just thinking about the trash and the needles that were everywhere. I honestly had no idea I would be intertwining myself with people experiencing homelessness. Andrea Suarez is the founder and CEO of We Heart Seattle, a nonprofit all volunteer waste management team. It's become her mission in life to clean up campsites using what she describes as a loving approach to the litter and the campers who left it there. We Heart Seattle heads out every weekend for cleanups. 
The volunteers spent part of Super Bowl Sunday under the Ship Canal Bridge, where they were able to bag up 20,000 pounds of junk, and they did it in four hours. That adds up quickly. By her count, We Heart Seattle has now disposed of more than 800,000 pounds of debris dating back to their first pickup in Denny Park in 2020. Suarez says that's given her some perspective on Seattle's homeless problem, and she's not afraid to engage in a little trash talk. I am now in the belly of the beast of our state of emergency as a private funded, untied hands, untied tongue that can speak about what I see. Things like not every tent is a home. Dozens and dozens of the tents you see underneath the, high, the highway are just revolving doors. If I had a dollar for every time somebody said, I'm good, I don't need housing, I don't need resources, I have a tiny house, I have a hotel, I have a family, I just come here for one thing and one thing only, and that's the drug use. We Heart Seattle does have its critics who say the group demonizes the homeless, but Suarez says many times the homeless people at pickup sites end up helping her crew. She's also helped more than a few campers beat their drug addictions and find employment and get a better place to live. And that includes three people who are now We Heart staff members. When we return, a fix for the state's police pursuit policy advances in Olympia, but not without some big changes at the last minute. One of the biggest votes this legislative session came right down to the wire. The House Committee on Community Safety, Justice and Reentry passed House Bill 1363 that we've told you about previously on the spotlight. It's a proposal to let officers chase suspects with fewer restrictions. They passed it a day before the committee bill cut off. But some of the yes votes had reservations about rolling back the original pursuit reform. The Spotlight's A.J. Janabel brings us the story from our state capitol. This is the first line from a letter signed by more than 200 leaders who represent 100 different Washington cities. Since 2021, police could only chase suspects in a car if they had probable cause, meaning they had evidence someone committed a crime. This new proposal gives back the authority to officers to chase with reasonable suspicion, meaning the belief someone committed a crime. On Thursday, a small group of lawmakers moved this proposal forward. We, we have to have laws that everybody follows. Otherwise, we get what we have right now. Under these new changes, officers can chase suspects for all domestic violence assaults and all vehicular assaults, as well as violent offenses, sex offenses, and DUIs, which is already on the books. So I think that is the right approach. We've learned some things uh, since the bill originally passed. So I'm open uh, to those ideas. But while these changes to pursuit laws are moving forward with an eight to one vote, some of the yeas still had concerns about people's safety. While the lone no vote said this legislation was more about public pressure than doing the right thing. I worry that there are going to be lives lost over this, even in just this two year period. And I really urge folks to vote no. But obviously I can't sign a bill that doesn't get to my desk. So I hope legislators will continue to discuss that. I hope some bill can get to my desk. Here's the thing, car theft, one of the most complained about crimes in our state that police couldn't pursue, did not make the cut in this version of the bill. And the committee made another tweak to the original text as well, and it's a big one. They added a two year sunset clause in hopes that the legislature will continue to collect police pursuit accident data and see if the policy results in more bystanders being hurt or killed. Some or all of these changes might be changed again during the full floor debate. We will keep you posted. Speaking of sunset clauses, the clock is ticking on a permanent fix on how the state will handle drug crimes. This after the state Supreme Court made the Blake decision, ruling that the state's felony drug possession law was unconstitutional. An interim measure in response to Blake has been in place since 2021, but it expires in July. Senate Bill 5536 would replace the interim measure. It makes knowingly possessing controlled substances a gross misdemeanor, but rather than putting the defendants behind bars, 5536 puts the emphasis on pretrial drug treatment and diversion programs. It's now before the Senate Ways and Means Committee, where it needs to pass before it can move to a full Senate debate. We're also keeping an eye on Senate Bill 5002, which would lower Washington's legal blood alcohol limit from 0 0.08 to 0 0.05. The bill comes as Washington wraps up one of the deadliest years on the roads in recent memory, with more than 700 fatalities, the most since 1990. Impairment by drugs and alcohol was involved in more than half of those deaths. 5002 is now before the Senate Rules Committee, which decides which bills will get full Senate hearings and when. 
Utah is the only state with a .05 limit right now. It reduced deadly crashes there by almost 20% in the first year it was implemented. Up next, a report card on fighting crime. Tacoma takes stock of its plan to reduce violence as the city prepares for phase two. We focused a lot tonight on police pursuits and one suspect who detectives tell the spotlight is taking advantage of the current pursuit rules is on a crime spree. Detectives say Gary Moyer, as recently as a few days ago, took off on a motorcycle when they tried to pull him over. Moyer has more than a dozen felony warrants for his arrest, including one for trying to drag away a bank ATM in Port Orchard using a stolen tow truck taken from Tacoma. That was in December. He was arrested, but he posted a half million dollars bail. Since he got out, detectives say he has victimized numerous other businesses and they need your help to stop him. He's got tattoos on his neck. One says mom and one says Alyssa. He also has a wife and a girlfriend, and he's usually with one of them out in public or committing his crimes. Call 911 if you see him. Bail has been preset by the court this time at a million dollars once he's caught. The city of Tacoma has spent months and a lot of money adopting a data-driven approach to crime fighting. The plan identifies crime hotspots and then directs extra resources to police them. We are now a half year into this project and Police Chief Avery Moore says it is working. He told the city council that murder, robbery and aggravated assault cases in the 15 hotspot zones dropped 19 percent compared to a year ago. Yet Tacoma is also coming off the most violent year it's seen on record with 45 homicides and there have already been five more murders this year. But Tacoma City Manager Elizabeth Polly says the crime plan was never meant to be a cure-all. I'm feeling challenged. Um, because as, as the chief said, policing and the issues of crime are way broader than the crime plan. The crime plan is one element of the of one tool and one element of our total approach to crime. And, and we still do have an issue in the community when there are juveniles being killed, when there are individuals who don't feel safe. While some crimes in the city are down, reports of stolen cars are up by more than 36 percent. And you guessed it, most of those are Kias and Hyundais tied to that TikTok hotwire trend. Meanwhile, city leaders in Seattle got the chance to hear from Police Chief Adrian Diaz about the recently released 2022 crime report. While violent crime and car thefts both reached a 15 year high last year, there was some good news, including a decrease in crime in the last three months of the year, a 7% decrease in bias crimes, and despite a shortage in staff, getting response times down to seven minutes. Addressing our violent crime and using our, our, our CAPE model, you know, continually working with our community, using analytics to put our officers in the right place. We want to make sure that people are, are uh, you know, coming out, doing walks in their community, coming downtown. We wanted people just to be much more active, um, and we're already seeing that activity pick up. If you'd like to check out the full 2022 crime report for yourself, we posted a link at fox13seattle.com. I don't care really much about the car very much. I just want the dog. A pet owner's vehicle is stolen with her dog still inside. So she turned to the spotlight for help. Hi, this message is for David Rose. Um, someone recommended you to us. Our car was stolen with both our dogs inside. A call for help from two Tacoma sisters who lost their pair of beloved pets to a car thief at a local Target store. The car and two dogs were taken after someone stole the woman's keys off her shopping cart. One of the pooches, Coconut, was found quickly, but there was no sign of Koji. Each hour that passed was more painful for his owners until they got a mystery phone call. Spotlight's Jennifer Dowling picks up the story from there. He's been crying this whole time. He's so happy. This video captured the moment Nicole and Julianne were able to hold Koji in their arms once again. We're all so very excited. We feel like we can finally breathe. It felt like a part of my heart was missing. Every night when I tried to go to sleep, I couldn't stop thinking about him. A man and woman returned the dog to the D'Amico sisters after he was stolen along with Nicole's car Sunday. Could you? Julianne's daughter, Juliet, and the family's second dog, Coconut, <laughs> also got in on the excitement. Koji doesn't talk. <laughs> Coconut was also stolen and found injured by a passerby on the side of the road Sunday. The second she saw Koji, she started smiling and jumping up and acting like her old self again. Nicole said their prayers were answered when someone called her cell phone late Tuesday. I got a call that was just, it just said Gig Harbor. Um, I answered the call. I said, hello, hello. The call disconnected. The sisters called back, but no answer. 
and I just texted them about their reward money because I had a feeling that would get a bite. Julianne was right. Someone responded telling them to meet at a 7-Eleven. Of course, once I saw him, I just jumped out of the car. I was like, Koji. <laughs> it was exhilarating. It was just like, I have a new lease on life. I'm so happy. I can't believe it. I, I thought it was one in a million that they were actually going to get found. Julian gave the woman and the man with her the reward money, asking where they found him. They said around the Tacoma Mall area, but we didn't get many details. You know, he's a sweet dog. A lot of people fall in love with him, but I think they they knew that we were missing him and there was a reward. So luckily they, they did the right thing in the end. Nicole says early Wednesday, police found her car with a man inside. It looked like they were just having a party in there. The car was a little worse for wear. It was just like roses spread everywhere, chocolates. Um, and it looks like they had a sort of a Valentine's maybe date in there. <laughs> you could see some, uh, there's like flowers, bottle of wine, which they didn't drink. So maybe they got interrupted. The sisters say the most important thing is that Koji is home. He's back to his old self, but he was definitely extra cuddly yesterday. Yeah. Those sisters were so lucky to get both of their dogs back. Sometimes it doesn't end that way. So it's a great reminder, never leave your pets in the car alone, even if you have the doors locked. There are too many thieves out there looking to steal your vehicle or take your pet and sell it. So next time you think about doing that, just remember this story. That's all the time we have on this edition of The Spotlight. If you have a tip or an idea for our next episode, please leave it on the Spotlight page at fox13seattle.com. Or we've also set up this Spotlight tip line. You can call us at the number on your screen, 206-674-1765. And we'll see you next week for another Spotlight. Until next time, be smart and please stay safe.